I will go ahead and introduce Gowan Batiste. She's with the Mountain Lion Foundation. Um, she actually is going to present two lectures for us. Um, this one, and then the one Gowan, I think I told you the 21st, it's actually the 28th of April. Um, so hopefully you can attend both of them. Um, I will let her go ahead and begin speaking while I see if anybody needs a link to the lecture. And I will um, So hi, everybody. Um, my name is Gowan Batiste, and I am a uh, sheep rancher and mountain lion enthusiast, um, you know, which I understand are maybe not two things that people generally associate with each other. Um, but I was really excited to be asked to, to give this presentation, and um, I'm excited to get into this stuff with you. Um, so it's a big topic. And um, like, like she was saying, this is gonna be a, a two-part series. We're gonna talk about mountain lions in California um, and what living in close proximity to them is, is like for us and what their current um, concerns are. Um, and then our next, um, our next lecture next month, um, I'm really gonna get into kind of nitty gritty details about what coexisting with mountain lions is like on the, um, the homestead scale, um, the house scale for people who live in neighborhoods that about wilderness areas. And then I'm gonna talk about rangeland management on a large scale too. So let's see. Um, so let me just do a quick chat. So um, I do need to actually have permission to share my screen again. <laughs> Um, when we got on earlier and did a test run of this, it worked fine. But now that I've logged back in, I uh, need permission again. So, Actually, give me one <laughs> quick second. I'm sorry. I was sharing a link. Yeah, no worries. There we go. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. No problem. Here we go. And. If you give me just one second. Here we go. This all takes a minute, you know, we're all, uh, we're all satellite internet. Um, so uh, this is a whole bunch of the stuff that I just already said. Um, my name is Gowan Batiste. I am the uh, coexistence uh, coordinator for the Mount Lion Foundation. And um, we're going to talk about mountain lions. So um, for those who are not familiar, uh, Mount Lion Foundation is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to ensuring that America's lion survives and flourishes in the wild. One way that we further this mission is by building greater public awareness about mountain lions through outreach, uh, education, and public events. We provide these educational opportunities for groups who are interested in and can benefit from this education, such as agricultural producers who want to keep livestock safe in mountain lion country, communities that are seeing mountain lions in their neighborhoods, and want to learn about how to coexist safely with big cats. As drought and wildfire push lions and their prey closer into irrigated spaces that humans occupy, it's especially important to learn about this native animal and how we can be the best neighbors possible with them. So here's a, uh, an introduction to the mountain lion, also called the puma um, concolor, um, which means of uniform color. Um, they're this like beautiful tawny russet color um, mountain lions go by many different regional names. Um, they, uh, one of the reasons why they have so many names is that they have an incredibly widely um, distributed territory. Um, I'm going to refer them to them mostly as lions, sometimes cats, but depending on where you are in the country, you may have heard a lot of different names for them, and uh, that's great. Um, and like their name says, they are of uniform color, except when they're newborn baby kittens, um, when they have spots for a period of a couple of months. Um, they are um, crepuscular. 
um, meaning that they're most active at dawn and dusk and they're an obligate carnivore. So um, they don't have the option to eat anything else. Uh, they're not like canids who may eat some plant material, may eat some stomach contents. Um, they are a pure carnivore. So these are some of the many names um, that these cats go by. They have the largest longitudinal range of any cat species, extending over 6,000 miles from Canada to Chile. They're endemic to the North and South American continents. So everywhere you are on Turtle Island is uh, mountain lion territory. <laughs> um, the latitudinal range of mountain lions has shrunk since colonial expansion. So lions used to occupy the entire continental United States, but are now mostly found as far east as Colorado and Texas. Um, there are small populations in the Dakotas and in Nebraska, as well as a subpopulation in Florida called the Florida panther. Some people think that this population is genetically distinct, but it's actually the same exact species um, as what you would find in the Western United States. Um, and actually their, their very limited gene pool in Florida has been supplemented uh, with cougars captured in Texas and released in Florida. So this is just a diagram really showing where, um, you know, where these mountain lions um, are native and where they're currently um, where they're currently thriving, where they're threatened, and where they've been extirpated. So as you can see, pretty much the whole eastern half of the United States, um, they've really pretty much been wiped out. Um, there are some individuals that are now starting to return. Um, the single longest um, migration of any, I think, large you know, cat species was a juvenile mountain lion that was headed east and ultimately was killed by a car. Um, so the history of lions in the Americas. Um, so these are cats that have a long history of living in this land. They have been here for at least 300,000 years, meaning that they were here during the Pleistocene. Um, these mountain lions coexisted alongside mastodons and uh, saber-toothed cats and dire wolves and giant sloths. Um, they're incredibly um, adaptable animals. They have the most uh, different names of any animal. Um, so they share a common ancestor. Um, with the myocids, a group of tree-dwelling carnivores that existed 62 to 34 million years ago and evolved in the modern order of carnivora. Within carnivora, mountain lions belong to the family Felidae and the genus Puma. They are jaguarndes, which I cannot pronounce for the life of me. Um, <laughs> they're part of the same limit lineage, but they're not in the genus Puma. So both cheetahs and mountain lions don't roar. They purr, though. Um, humans have tens of thousands of years of coexistence with mountain lions, and many cultures have rich traditions centered around them. Um, Zuni culture um, says that ancient ones wanted the world to be guarded by those keen of sight and scent, like the cougar. Miwoks viewed the cougar as the ideal hunter and the chief among the animals. Um, Apache and um, Hualapai view cougar wailing as an omen of death. And Dene said that the puma provides benefits to other animals by leaving large portions of their kill behind for them to eat, which modern science is just beginning to recognize how true that is and how much mountain lions provide scaffolding for hundreds of other species through their kill sites. Um, several indigenous groups um, created societies historically that embody the skill and power of the cougar. The Zia Pueblo in New Mexico have a cougar society. Um, which exists to help hunters in the pursuit of game. Um, membership in the Opi Warrior Society of the Cochiti Pueblo was only obtained by either killing a warrior in battle or hunting a puma. Additionally, some cultures carry around carvings, wood stones um, for success in deer hunting. Um, additionally, the cougar is seen as a medicinal creature by the Aztecs who use cougar bone and gall in their healing. So while some indigenous groups 
um, have historically hunted cougars, used parts of their body medicinally or ritually. Um, the impact on the species at the time from hunting is minor. Um, the difficulty of hunting the cats and because human densities were relatively low and also due to the fact that there have been distinct and powerful cultural traditions around these animals um, for tens of thousands of years. And that's something that's important. It, actually, just recently, um, I read a study that was talking about um, big cat behavior when in regards to humans. And this is a published academic study written by people with PhDs. And in it, they make this truly shocking statement that unlike um, unlike jaguars and unlike leopards and unlike cheetahs, mountain lions have a very limited experience of humans of only a couple hundred years, so they don't have the same coevolutionary reactions to us. And that's just absolutely false. They've just forgotten that there were people here many tens of thousands of years ago. So not only were mountain lions around when mastodons were around, but they've also been around humans a long time and they're very good at living alongside us. So to talk about the colonial and the modern era, <laughs> actually, I don't know if you like heard my, my dog and I feel the same way about the colonial and modern era with uh, mountain lions. Um, so mountain lions experienced really widespread persecution and near total annihilation. Um, the era of colonial expansion marked a drastic reduction in many wildlife populations in North America, including mountain lions. European settlers, blinded by racism and ignorance, saw it as a moral duty to civilize both Native American cultures and Native American animals. Um, cougars were no exception. There's a lot of writing about them from the colonial era talking about them as wild, savage, and evil and calling for their complete elimination, which was nearly achieved. Um, they were seen as a threat to people, but also a threat to domestic livestock. In the Eastern US, the first documented boundary for cougars known locally as catamounts was established in Connecticut in 1684. Boundaries continued into the 18th and 19th centuries as Eastern forests were cleared and the cougars habitat was subdivided and fragmented. The last known cougar in Vermont was killed in 1881, followed by the last cougar in Pennsylvania in 1891. Cougars were extinct east of the Mississippi by 1900. As settlers moved further west, their livestock displaced many populations of bison, pronghorn, deer, and elk that cougars relied on for prey. Since livestock were increasingly available and easy to kill, cougars took the occasional sheep, goat, or cow, further cementing the exaggerated sentiment that the cats were evil beasts. Theodore Roosevelt was even quoted saying that cougars were the big horse-killing cat, the destroyer of the deer, the lord of stealthy murder, but who faces his doom with a heart both craven and cruel. He was reportedly very disappointed in how unaggressive mountain lions were and that they would rather run away than fight, making them not so much fun to hunt. Uh, since very little scientific information was available on the cats, people let exaggeration and hyperbole about mountain lions' capacity for death and destruction uh, become the dominant narrative. Cougar bounties continued into the 20th century with the birth of the Animal Damage Control Program, or ADC, in 1931. This branch of the USDA paid bounty hunters to eradicate species determined to be a threat to agriculture, including mountain lions, wolves, coyotes, bobcats, prairie dogs, gophers, jackrabbits, and others. From the early 1900s to the 1980s, ADC's cougar bounties resulted in the killing of over 66,000 cougars, including with poisons that led to the unintentional slaughter of non-target animals and pets. Beginning in the 1960s, most Western states shifted cougar status from evil predator to big game animal. Nevada was one of the first states to reclassify cougars as a game animal in 1965, and most states followed suit. So that began the era of managing mountain lions under the North American model of wildlife conservation, which means managing the species to provide hunting opportunities. So the only Western state that, that did not follow this model is California, where a referendum was passed in 1990, giving cougars complete protection from sports hunting. So we are very lucky in California, we're the only state that does not consider them a, a game animal to be hunted. Um, Texas is uh, the extreme opposite end of the spectrum. 
um, and they're considered a varmint there or a, a nuisance animal and have no protections um, whatsoever. Um, so to get into behavior, so today, and it must be said in part because of interest in um, managing mountain lions for hunting purposes, we know a lot more about the species. About the species. Um, and our public understanding has less folklore in it, although you'll still see quite a lot of it pop up. Um, mountain lions are obligate carnivores. Their main prey is deer. Um, they're primarily solitary, but can be seen to show social behavior. They know their neighbors. They share kills with each other and each other's cubs sometimes. They've been documented doing that in fairly large groups. Um, they, their kittens stay with their mothers for up to two years. Um, and they're quite good at avoiding people. Um, they don't act like a, an apex predator in many ways. Remember, they've been around for at least 300,000 years. And they co-evolved with predators much bigger than them. Um, cave lions, short-faced bears, all those fun Pleistocene critters, these guys are pretty good at staying out of the way, and that seems to be what their adaptation mostly is. So cute baby kittens. Um, so they gestate for three months, uh, two to four kittens a litter, which is a really small number. Kittens dependent for, 18, for 12 to 18 months, so fully dependent um, for a long time. They're polygamous, um, then they live 10 to 12 years in the wild, up to 20 years uh, in captivity. Um, let's see. So dispersal and territory. So dispersal, which basically means, you know, young adults that are leaving their mother, um, are called transients. And anywhere from a year to a year and a half, sometimes up to two years, um, where that'll happen. Their territories are huge, uh, 25 to 400 square miles. That's a lot of land to cover. Um, the size and location depends on prey availability. In more arid marginal land, they have bigger territories. Um, in land where more food is available, they can exist closer to each other. Um, male and female territories often overlap where one male will have territory that covers the, the separate territories of multiple females. Um, but you know, females don't tend to overlap with other females and males don't tend to overlap with other males. And um, they establish boundaries with scrapes. Um, sometimes you can see these on trees or on the ground and they're pretty dramatic. Um, we found one not long ago. And, you know, putting my hand over it, I mean, these, these scrapes are, are huge. Um, so, let's see. We have considerably more information about, um, about their diets as well. Um, an average in area of land that supports 360 deer supports one lion. That's a lot of deer per lion. Um, they, they tend to prey primarily on deer and other ungulates, although sometimes they eat animals as small as rodents. Um, they're pretty adaptable um, and they want gradual slopes and ample cover. They don't like to be in big exposed plains and, you know, they tend to like to, to be areas where they can quickly escape and they can observe without being seen. So in the era of climate change, <laughs> why are these animals so important? So we want, we need to make the case for why mount, mountain lions are an ideal species to protect in the era of climate change, especially because they have a tendency to be fairly marginalized. People are, are understandably intimidated by them. They're a large obligate carnivore. Um, you know, they are solitary and elusive. They're hard to, um, they're harder to relate to in some ways than other, other predators like wolves that have these like gregarious social you know, uh, families that we can kind of relate to our own families. But there are so many reasons why they are an incredibly important species to maintain in the wild. Um, and a big part of that is their, their cache sites. So this graphic is kind of showing um, how many animals 
rely on uh, mountain lion cache. So they protect waterways in ways that I'll explain. Um, but the carrion, just by itself, the carrion supports countless species, including other predators like wolves that are also ecosystem engineers. I know a lot of people saw that really famous article about how wolves change rivers. Well, wolves and mountain lions kind of go together. Um, wolves actually love robbing mountain lion kill sites, and mountain lions seem to be fairly well adapted to them doing that, and to a certain extent kind of expect them to. Um, but mountain lions leave more of their kill behind than wolves who hunt and kill in packs. So they protect ecosystems and other wildlife. Um, and these are, there's a number of different studies here um, that we're referencing that I can talk about in a little bit more detail, but um, you know, improving the health of ungulate herds. Um, mountain lions are seeking out um, the weak and the sick, um, the young and the old, you know, they're an opportunistic um, hunter that is hunting alone. They're not going after the, the strongest and the healthiest animal. Um, and they're also, you know, thereby um, maintaining forage for the animals that are the healthiest. Um, and in terms of providing food for other animals, you know, we've already talked about how important these cage sites are. So this, this photo is from Mark Elbrock. And you can see this, um, you know, partially eaten deer that's been buried under loose detritus, which is actually something I should probably talk about more is what is a cache. So um, when mountain lions hunt deer, um, they want to be able to eat from that carcass as long as possible. So they are actually incredibly tidy compared to other predators like bears and wolves. It's actually a diagnostic tool to know whether it's in fact been a mountain lion that has killed an animal and is eating it is they pluck hair, they remove the digestive organs, um, and they very tidily will cover their deer with pine needles and leaves and loose debris and usually not dirt, unlike bears. Um, but the, you know, one lion is not able to eat an entire deer. So there are many other animals that then are able to take advantage of that to the point that the biological diversity at every trophic level, including from insects to amphibians, goes up in the presence of mountain lions. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but the Gilbert et al. study from 2017 is really fascinating. Um, they actually did an analysis of the both the money and the human lives that would be saved by reintroducing mountain lions uh, to the eastern half of the country. So um, we can look at here is mountain lion um, impacts on ecosystems and other um, other wildlife. So the most interactions of any other carnivore, meaning that they're, they're impacting other animals all around them. Um, this, this quote, you know, the landscape of fear, um, I, I think is maybe less accessible. Um, we talk about it a lot in regenerative grazing, but put really simply, um, ungulates behave really differently in the presence of apex carnivores. Um, than they do otherwise. And you can see this photograph above um, the in the presence of mountain lions and the photograph below, and that's from Ripple and Beshta from 2006. And you can see that when there's not apex predators and specifically when mountain lions aren't present, um, there's a tendency for elk and deer to overbrowse and overgraze riparian areas and really limit the, the biodiversity that exists there. And when they do that, um, let me see. When they do that, you end up with an overall reduction of the number of species because all of that edge that you're seeing up above, all of that shade, those rush clumps, um, there's animals at every trophic level that can take advantage of that extra space. Um, so this is also from the, the Ripple and, and Beshta study. And you can see this is Zion National Park, um, intact cougar populations. Um, high human visitation areas because they, um, they avoid humans with low cougar densities. Deer are not as shy of people as mountain lions are. And areas that mountain lions avoid become areas that deer tend to seek out. Um, and you can see what happens. There's actually significantly reduced stream flow um, because you don't have all those stabilizing plants at the edge of the riparian um, area there. 
there's what much lower species diversity. Ultimately, that's not good for the deer either. And then this is another, um, I, you know, again, like, you know, I quote this study a lot because I think it's, it's fascinating um, and really important for a, a lot of what we're, we're discussing here. But, um, you know, you can really look at like everything from like, well, what does a mountain lion have to do with um, cattails or amphibians or butterflies? Um, but you can see that when cougars are common, um, so is so much else in biodiversity. And one of the things that is just an inescapable truth about ruminant populations is that they've co-evolved for millennia in the presence of very significant hunting pressure. And when that hunting pressure is taken away, there's a massive, uh, this massive damage that happens to the ecosystem that they live in. Um, mountain lions and humans. <laughs> Um, so how do humans benefit from mountain lions? Um, so we can kind of talk about this. Um, <laughs> we can talk about the study now, um, the, Gilbert, the Gilbert study, um, where they actually analyzed um, the, the savings to um, human life and um and dollars and found that it was you know it was in the billions of dollars that um that come directly from deer vehicle strikes and that a um a resident mountain lion population um would reduce the deer population by around 20 percent and that would um that would save over 100 human lives um which is amazing <laughs> you know Especially, there's a lot of a fear that you know mountain lions can um, can kill people, and they're certainly capable of that, and they certainly have done that in very rare and isolated incidents. Um, they're a large, powerful lion, but the reality is that the presence of mountain lions actually saves a lot more human lives um, than they take. You know, there's been less than a dozen in a hundred years. Um, versus the number of people that are killed in deer vehicle strikes. Um, and then there's also, there needs to be more research into this to confirm it, but there's a study that suggests that mountain lions were targeting specifically deer that were infected with chronic wasting disease, which is a major problem in the eastern half of the United States, and also Lyme disease. So, you know, one of the other things that we need to think about with um, mountain lion presence and the abundance of deer is how many human beings are getting Lyme disease from deer ticks as well that mountain lions reduce um, and the health of the deer as well. So, you know, there are many benefits provided by cougars in addition to their ecological benefit. Um, by supporting ecosystem functions like improved waterway health, there's also downstream benefits for people. Um, the presence of lions increases wildlife watching opportunities, as well as hunting opportunities for other ruminants. Um, people also just enjoy seeing them. I mean, there's something enlivening and satisfying about the presence of mountain lions. Um, Jacobs et al. in 2018 um, actually did a survey um, showing that uh, it, many people just derive satisfaction from knowing that they exist, which I think is valuable. I mean, those are, we're, we're categorizing things really um, mechanically, but there's a value in just knowing that, you know, as a, uh, as a country, we haven't completely eliminated all of our native large predators, at least on half the, at least on half the country. Um, and that's a real value. So despite these myriad benefits, um, some people choose to focus on the perceived problems with cougars. So addressing each of these areas um, could be a whole presentation. And we do frequently give those presentations and, um, and we will be. But um, briefly, I'm gonna talk about some of the push and pull factors that are impacting mountain lions in California specifically. So um, threats to mountain lions. So changes to habitat suitability, um, mortality factors such as um, hunting, lethal removal, vehicle collisions, and then barriers to movement. 
So mostly roads, but also new subdivisions. Um, these are the things that are, are pushing mountain lions out of their established territories, um, pushing a mountain lion out of his established territory into another mountain's territory. Mountain lion's territory could also cause mortality by conflict. Um, there's all kinds of ways that um, human actions impact mountain lions. So reduction in habitat suitability, less forage is available. There's higher quality footed forage in cities. Um, you know, we're, I don't know about where y'all live, but we're in an incredibly serious drought. Um, they're talking about, you know, the worst spring in a hundred years. Um, ungulates go where there's food for them to eat. Um, there's food on irrigated lawns and there's food in irrigated pastures um, because human beings are irrigating land. So if that's where the deer are going, these are bighorn sheep on a golf course, um, that's where the mountain lions are gonna go too. So when we're in a drought, um, we have their prey species coming closer into humans because they're seeking refuge from the drought conditions um, to their forage, um, that's gonna pull mountain lions behind them too. Um, barrier to movement. Um, mountain lion vehicle collisions are um, a real serious problem. Like, as I said, one of the, the longest dispersing migrating young lions um, was killed by a vehicle strike. There was a vehicle strike this month um, in Southern California too. Um, it's why wildlife crossings are so important. And as this is saying, like decreased genetic diversity from isolation, when you have a little pocket of wilderness and development comes up all around it, it becomes very dangerous for a mountain lion to cross that development to try to access other populations of lions. Before too long, um, you've got a genetic bottleneck. Um, hunting is an additional source of mortality. It damages mountain lion social structure. It increases conflict with humans. So for some people, that's a big um, statement. And I, I think I'm going to take this moment to um, recommend this book because I don't want to just read out all of the, the studies that it cites. Um, and we can talk about this more later. But um, a brief example um, given in this book, and they, they go into the science behind it in depth, is um, an adult male lion was shot and killed by a hunter, um, which was legal in the state that it was done in. And it actually resulted in the death of five other mountain lions. Um, because when that adult, territorial adult male was removed, um, young transient males started traveling through the, um, through the territory. Um, one of those transient males started a fight with a, a mature female mountain lion. Um, they both died of their injuries. And then her three young cubs starved to death. And in the process of them starving to death, they um, had conflict with humans. They were seen on trails following people multiple times. They were trying to eat pets because they were desperate and they were too young to be alone. So that's a, about as stark of a, an example as we can give that you know the lethal take of a healthy adult mountain lion, not only does it lead to the deaths of five other mountain lions, but also directly to conflict with humans. And in this case, um, the Park Service actually tried provisioning these teenage mountain lion cubs, they actually left them a um, carcass of a deer for them to feed on, hoping that they would stabilize and be able to, you know, be able to um, go on. But at, by that point, too much damage had been done to them. So because mountain lions stay with their mothers for so long, it can often seem like they're adults when they're really not, they're really not ready to be alone. And those mountain lions that are orphaned are the most likely to come into conflict with humans because they're the most desperate. So when we talk about, we've got changes to habitat suitability because we have fire, we have drought, we have development, we've got um, hunting, we've got lethal removal, which is you know when a mountain lion um, has possibly killed livestock, it can be you know lethally taken. And then we've got barriers, so when we start looking at these all coming together at once, situation gets kind of dire. So um, in the context of all of this, our mountain lion encounters on the rise. So 
there's push factors pushing them closer to us. So there's more prey closer to humans because there's drought. So the prey is going where the irrigation is and the mountain lions go where the prey is. There's more roads and development, meaning that their movement is restricted and they're being kind of funneled along narrower and narrower channels. There's more development of people out into their habitat, more people living on the, on the urban wildlife fringe. Um, but really more than anything else, um, it's a lot easier to see them now. <laughs> And I, I feel like this comes up for me a lot is, you know, mountain lions are not exploding in how common they are. Um, what's going on is that home security systems and camera systems are a lot more affordable and available than they used to be. So a lot more people are seeing the mountain lions that have always been there. Again, they've co-evolved alongside humans for millennia. They're really good at not being seen and at not causing problems. Most of the time they don't. But, you know, when somebody gets a, a video of a mountain lion walking through their yard on a ring camera, and then all their neighbors do too, it seems like this invasion, the mountain lions have always been there. We're just seeing them more. So um, these are all links, um, but this, these are all from March. <laughs> So I wanted to talk about these a little bit and I can, I can share them and, you know, we could possibly even go to them, but um, I actually saw this one this morning. So famous Rocky Mountain bull elk eaten by a mountain lion. So this was a beloved bull elk who's been photographed by many, many, many people. Um, he's in Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, his, his name was like, um, um, like Bruno the Incredible. <laughs> Um, this beautiful, beautiful bull elk. I love elk so much. Um, and uh, he has passed away. He was 10 years old. Um, he has produced many, many, many offspring. He was the age of senescence for an elk. He was injured very badly by another male elk during the rut this fall. And researchers lost track of him during a snowstorm um, where he was, you know, in, very badly injured in a snowstorm and he's 10 years old, which is ancient. Um, when his body was found, it had been fed on by a mountain lion. The title of the article that was chosen is the beloved famous bull elk has been eaten by a mountain lion. And the comments are full of people calling for the killing of the responsible mountain lion. Um, so, you know, I, I love elk. I love sheep. Yeah, I'm a sheep rancher. Every ruminant ends its life with predation. It just does. Um, but pretty much what will happen is they get old, they get injured, they have bad weather, and then they get taken out by a predator. There is no retirement home for elk. There's no hospice care program for elk. Um, even when there's, there are other factors, like an antler injury during rut and then a bad storm, generally speaking, their life will end with predation. And this is true everywhere. When you look at the La Brea tar pits, even, you know, you have mastodons that have been in, enclosed in tar, you know, hermetically sealed from the world. They're not free of predation either. <laughs> Those tar pits are full of cave lions and dire wolves and probably even pumas going in to get them as they're drowning in tar. You know, um, Bruno lived a wonderful elk life and then he died a wonderful elk death. You know, and we don't need to go find and kill this mountain lion for eating Bruno. But this is the kind of discourse that exists that we have to find compassionate ways to talk back to. Um, so then actually, <laughs> several of these stories were really the same mountain lion. Um, mountain lion pursued by animal control, tries to hide in a hair salon, doesn't understand how windows work, jumps into the window. Um, mountain lion enters office building where it is then sedated. The best we could find is that this lion was relocated and not killed, um, but often they will not share that information. Now, this mountain lion didn't hurt anyone, didn't bluff charge anybody, didn't eat anybody's cat. 
and just wandered into the wrong neighborhood, probably followed a deer and then couldn't figure out how to get out. And a bunch of people called animal control. And then trying to get away from someone trying to shoot it with a tranquilizer dart, it ran into a hair salon and then ran into an office building. So, you know, these are the things that can happen, um, especially as uh, deer are coming closer into towns and cities. I don't know if any of you guys saw the mountain lion in Visalia wandering around the swimming pool. This is another, you know, ring camera capture. This mountain lion thought somebody's pool noodle was potentially something it could eat and then swam to safety from the animal control officers that were called across the pool and got away. Um, so this is just the month of March. Anytime that these things happen, when there's a mountain lion sighting, and again, like a mountain lion sighting in its native habitat, because all of California, this is all California, by the way, um, except for Bruno. Um, it's not news. It's it really it's it's not news. They've always been here. Um, you know, they are potentially dangerous if they're cornered. But most of the time, if you give them enough space to get away, they will. You know, I saw a video today of um, a, you know, a, a good neighbor sabotaging somebody's hunting and releasing a mountain lion from a leg hold trap. And they managed to hold this mountain lion down and get its toes out of this trap. And the second they backed off and gave it space to turn around and run, it did. But when you're very close to them, they're not gonna make themselves vulnerable by turning their back. They're gonna bluff. They're gonna make themselves look big. Um, so they need space to be able to actually get away from us. Um, and then another collar juvenile mountain lion killed by a hit and run in Orange County. So, you know, these, these are the kinds of things that are happening all the time. It's the reason why we really need wildlife crossings. And then this is a study on the impact of California wildlife. Um, California wildfires on mountain populations. They're estimating that just the 2020 wildfires impacted 15% of all mountain lions in uh, California. And if you think about that, how many years in a row can we have events where 15% of an entire species population is um, taken out? We can't, you know. So I think you know, one of the takeaways from this, and one of the reasons why I bring up these stories from California in the month of March is to kind of give an idea of what these push and pull factors are and how people understand them and talk about them. You know, when a mountain lion is wandering around a swimming pool, it's it's not stalking, it's it's passing through a neighborhood, you know. <laughs> when a mountain lion tries to hide in a hair salon, you know, that's a very confused and freaked out mountain lion. The mountain lion was, was not there for a trim. It did not want to be there, you know. So um, given all of these factors, given drought, wildfire, um, climate change, more development of neighborhoods into wildlife areas, what do we need to do? So um, remove attractants. Don't feed deer. Um, reduce hiding places around your house. That's important for fire safety anyway. You know, have a, have a buffer where you don't have brush right up against your building. Um, there are deterrents that you can um, put into place. Like there are motion activated sprinklers that flash lights and make a high pitched shriek. You know, please bring your cats inside. It's so important for bird populations and it will keep them from being eaten by mountain lions. And they do sometimes eat domestic cats. Um, talk to your neighbors. You know, this is something that um, we're going to be living with. Um, we have always been living with, but as more and more people are wanting to live in the country, and as we continue to deal with this like cycling drought and water and wildfire spiral, um, we need more and better tools. And I'm going to get into a lot of this. If it seems like I'm rushing through this, I really am because I do want this presentation to be a standalone um, presentation, but I'm going to get into all of this in a lot more detail on the next presentation. Um, so when you're out on the trail, um, avoid dawn, dusk, and after dark. So mountain lions are crepuscular. They're the most active in the morning and in the evening. Um, but that said, 
it's not an emergency if you see one during the day. They can be out anytime. If they're out during the day, it doesn't mean they're sick. It doesn't mean that they're more dangerous. Um, but generally speaking, like, you know, like the half light is when they're going to be most active. And I like to give them their space during that time. Um, stay on the trail, know where you are. Um, hike in groups. If you're going out into areas that you know are mountain lion territory, um, keep your children close, keep your pets on a leash, um, make sound, be aware of your surroundings. And most importantly, don't inspect carcasses. If you come across a mountain lion cache, the mountain lion's probably nearby. Um, and because we're talking about the trail right now, most people have seen the viral video of the hiker in, in Utah um, who was filming mountain lion clubs and who got these incredibly dramatic and actually really cool bluff charges on video. And unfortunately, most of the clips that were actually sent out on social media and by news reports cut out the part at the beginning where he was actually approaching the cubs and filming them and just cut straight to this like very angry mama mountain lion doing her huge bluff charges with her paws turned out and her big bounces. Um, that's not hunting behavior. That is bluff behavior. Um, and when you see in that video, the second that he threw a rock at her, she was gone. So um, if you come across a mountain lion, they're cats. They're very similar to house cats. Um, if it's relaxed, if it's just looking at you, then it's probably just looking at you. Um, if it has a hunched stance and its tail is twitching, that's a time to be more concerned. So what do you do if you're encountering a mountain lion that does seem to be displaying um, concerning behavior? Um, make yourself as large as possible, um, be loud, uh, call for help, make eye contact, slowly create distance and protect yourself. Give the mountain lion space to turn around and leave. And that's something that people often forget to do. Um, but a mountain lion doesn't want to turn its back on you um, because, you know, they don't, I think that on some level, they don't know that there's no more cave lions and short-faced bears um, because they're quite, they seem, they're quite cautious. They're worried of being attacked themselves. So they need to have enough space to actually turn around and leave. So trying to create distance slowly is really important. Um, protect yourself. You know, it, one of the things that that hiker in Utah does really well is bend down quickly and throw a handful of rocks at this lion. And that's all it took, you know, and she was gone. Um, they do not want to get injured. If they are injured even minorly to the extent that it will impact their ability to hunt, they'll starve to death. So they would much rather run than fight. And then the last thing that I, I will say, um, so I actually have been in, um, been in a situation where I was face-to-face -face with a mountain lion that didn't have enough space to turn around and run. Um, very early in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, going out to help my friend with their goats. And um, there was a mountain lion that was actually an orphaned teenage mountain lion, very similar situation where their mother had been shot. And um, we were face to face and it was hissing and spitting and it, neither of us had enough space to back up. I had my back against a wall. It has its back against, you know, it was, that's, that's kind of worst case scenario really. Um, and my neighbor came and blew a horn at it and it was gone instantly. It was like, um, it was like it evaporated. So I always carry these now. Um, it's very small. It fits in your pack, um, fits in my hiking bag. Um, I hike out three miles each way to check on my flock where they are now. And we have mountain lions on game camera traveling through the creek corridors through where I walk all the time. And this just goes with me and it stays accessible in a little outside flap. And I know that these work because it worked. So, you know, there are affordable, easy tools that you can have, um, to just, decrease the chances of having any conflict. But in general, it's just important to remember um, they don't see us as prey and we really shouldn't act as prey. Um, what, if you look at what deer do or what ruminant animals like elk do, um, they'll stalt, which is this funny word for like how they basically bounce and stomp. 
um, and they look healthy and they look vigorous. Um, you don't want to freeze. Tonic immobility looks like you're struggling um, and you're, you're not a good candidate for survival. You want to basically be showing this mountain lion, like, I am going to be too much work for you. And they're very persuadable uh, to that point. Um, and then, you know, continue your education and get involved. There's all kinds of opportunities, um, you know, to learn about like what this history is. There's so many different levels to get involved in. There's um, to talk about, you know, whatever it is that you're interested in. If you're somebody who spends a lot of time hiking in the outdoors, um, you have topics to discuss. If you're someone who's a hunter who is hunting deer or elk, there's a lot to discuss. Um, if you're just somebody who lives in a neighborhood and like, you know, maybe has like a creek corridor or not too far from where you live, um, then this is totally something that is relevant to you. Um, if you're someone who goes to hair salons now, apparently, um, this is relevant to you. If you live in California, anywhere in California, including downtown San Francisco, every part of California is mountain lion territory. Um, and then getting involved. You know, like I said earlier, anywhere from 25 to 400 square miles. These are massive territories. There are very few, if any of us, that are directly controlling the amount of, of land that a mountain lion is gonna be living on. This is a community um, enterprise for us. You know, we need to be talking to our neighbors. We need to be talking to our public servants. We need to be talking to our lawmakers. Um, and we should ideally do that in the most informed way possible. So, you know, Mountain Lion Foundation um, is available to help with that. You know, we, we can be reached out to by community groups, neighborhood associations, um, individual um, homeowners, if there's a concern or a depredation issue. Um, you know, we're here for everybody. Um, you know, I'm a, a livestock producer, I'm a rancher. Um, I don't want my sheep to get killed and eaten by mountain lions either. Um, I want people to feel safe and confident um, being out on trails and out in the woods. Um, and I also want mountain lions to be safe and confident. And I think we, we do have a situation where everybody can win, um, but it takes collective action. Um, this, it's not an individual game here. Um, so these are just some citations of uh, what we talked about. Um, and I'm available for questions. <laughs> and um, I would love to um, check out the chat. Um, I realized that I really flew through that. There's a lot of information in there. If there's anything that um, folks want to investigate further or um, anything that, you know, anything else that needs to be brought up, um, please don't be shy. Um, and to start with, we'll look at the chat here. So we have somebody asking if it would be possible to suggest the brand of air horn. Honestly, um, you know, this is a sport and safety horn. I, I think it was originally called a saber, but the label's kind of gone now. Um, it was $12, you know, there's um, any marine air horn um, is gonna work just fine. And so somebody's asking for the citation page to be up a little longer. And yes, it can be. So there's two, so there's two citation pages here. Um, so you can see, um, a lot of different um, books and studies here. Um, and then I also just brought a couple of books with me. Um, I really recommend um, The Cougar Conundrum. It's specifically talking about um, coexistence and mountain lion biology and mountain lions as social creatures and the impacts um, and ripple effects of human management on mountain lions more broadly. Um, practical tracking is another really great one. Um, which, you know, it's about mountain lions. It talks about um, a lot of North American 
animals, um, but really fascinating approach to kind of being out in the outdoors. And then, you know, this one is pretty old school at this point. Um, cougar, the American lion. Um, we actually have the entirety of this available on Mountain Lion Foundation's website. You can just go read it. Um, and it is, um, it's a really great primer. You know, it's, a, it's an early 90s. Um, the foreword is by Robert Redford. Um, and it's in a, it was produced in association with the Mount Lion Foundation. And it's a, just a great, um, it's a great general overview um, to the kind of, kinds of topics that we brought up here. So then here's the next page of the work cited. Um, this is a great one. Mountain lions prey selectively on prion infected mule deer. That's great. Everybody knows what prions are. They attack your brain. Um, <laughs> just really quickly, this will be on um, our YouTube page also once it's edited and all of the chat beforehand is taken out. Um, so if rather than copy all this down, if you want to um, check that out too, if that's easier for you, just to let you know, we'll yeah. be there. Sorry to interrupt. No problem. Okay, so I'm seeing a few more questions in the chat here. So um, a person is asking if in California, are pigs a primary prey for lions? I wouldn't say that they're primary. Um, there's definitely quite a lot of feral hogs in California, and I'm sure that mountain lions eat them. Um, feral hogs are something we deal with all over, all over California. Um, and it certainly wouldn't surprise me. I have definitely, so we have mountain lions on game cameras here following um, pig trails, trails that pigs are also using. Um, so yes, they likely are. Um, in general, mountain lions really like to eat ungulates and they primarily are like to focus on deer. Um, and then here's another question about the de depredation measures that MLF helped affect in a local school district and what the students learned from the experience. So, you know, we can kind of dig into um, a lot of this stuff, um, but in that case, there, there was a recent, um, there was a recent depredation at a, at a school in, in my uh, region. And uh, what happened in that case was a really classic, um, a really classic kind of setup for failure, um, where there were there were goats that were outside at night, unprotected, no shelter, no lights, no nothing, just in an open yard. And uh, right on the other side of their fence was a uh, creek corridor. Well, deer like to travel creek corridors, and so do mountain lions. So after keeping animals in that setting for almost 20 years with no problems, they did have a problem. They had a mountain lion come over the fence and take a goat. And um, so what we did in that case is that we advised on immediate steps to take. And then we actually went out and helped them build a mountain lion safe enclosure um, that there are plans for on our website um, that you can access for free um, to do yourself. And also installed, um, a deterrent device is called gadflies, which are motion activated and have flashing lights and a high pitched alarm that mountain lions really don't like. Um, and then they actually, they did something pretty novel too. And they put up a Christmas decoration that was a T-Rex uh, with a Santa hat. <laughs> that was one of those fan, you know, blow up ones that kind of that shakes around and has lights. And, um, you know, I can't say that we officially endorse that because there is no peer reviewed study saying that that works. But um, colloquially, I've seen many people on um, various websites promoting the use of essentially like lawn art as another kind of deterrent too. Um, so yeah, I mean, that those are all things that, that we do is try to, to help spread education and awareness and also practical, practical support. You know, because just because you've gotten away with something for 20 years doesn't mean that it's going to continue to work. You know, these animals are adaptive. They're moving all the time. We have individuals that have traveled, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles. Um, they have huge territories. And, you know, you could get a new lion in your neighborhood that's going to approach things differently than your last lion did. They're individuals. So learning about their biology, learning about their... Um, 
learning about their tendencies is really important, but so is being adaptive and responsive and um, proactive. Um, the most effective uh, tools and strategies are proactive ones. Is there any other questions? And also, again, Gowan will be presenting the second um, lecture on a, April 28th. <laughs> Think what month it was. Um, and she'll be talking about land management and coexisting and how food systems affect um, wildlife in general and um, specifically mountain lions. So um, please tune in for that also. Totally. And yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, you know, mountain lions are a widely misunderstood but really important umbrella species. And in many ways, they're a, a litmus test for how an entire ecosystem is doing. So, you know, in this era of climate change and destabilization that we're experiencing, it's even more important to be keeping a close eye on them and how they're doing. And um, also just making sure that we're being good neighbors. Great, Alan, thank you. Thank okay. you guys. Um, cool. I guess we will sign off and hopefully we'll see you all um, in April. And again, this recording will be on um, our Tuli, or yeah, the Tuliomi um, YouTube page if you'd like to revisit or share it with anybody. Thanks, Gowan. No, thank you. Have a good night, everybody.